In Jesus' name, we love you, we praise you, we honor you. I pray that you'll give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Open the word for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. In the very beginning of your Bible, we have a unique story. I don't mean to imply by the word story that it's a fable. It's not a fable. I believe it to be literal and actual. But the story goes something like this. Adam and Eve are created and given a domain, a garden to live in. And the garden is perfect in every way. In and about the middle of the garden, there are two trees. One, the knowledge of good and evil. And the other tree is the tree of life. Adam and Eve are granted permission to eat from the tree of life, but not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're given free reign and free access to the tree of life, and it appears, thank you, Lord, that something in the tree of life enabled them to have eternal life. Now, was this some sort of nutrient or vitamin or substance in this tree that was sustaining them? Or was it just that God said, you reach out and you take from this tree and you'll live forever? We don't know. How it worked, we don't know. We just know that as long as they took from that tree and ate, their biological clocks never ticked. They were frozen, if you will, in time, in terms of being eternally young and eternally healthy. There were no weeds in the garden. There was nothing for them to work. They could tend the garden and eat from the tree and they would live forever. And one day, they were introduced to something new. Now we know that the serpent came into the garden and the serpent challenged what God had said, but what we don't know is how many times the serpent came into the garden. Was this the first time or was he a regular caller? Because they didn't seem to be shocked. And then something interesting happens. Remember, to this point in time, there had never been a lie. They'd never lied to each other. They certainly couldn't lie to God. He was walking in the garden with them from time to time. There'd never been a lie. Everything had been the truth. And so in comes this very impressive creature, and he was impressive. If you want to look him up in the Bible, you can find many references to how he looked, covered in gemstones breathing fire, able to speak in a language they understood. And he challenges God's word. And they fell for it. They believed the lie. And so the result of that was God said, here's what's going to happen. I am now going to cut you off from the tree of life. Pack your bags. You're leaving the garden. And so they're cast out of the garden. And then God said, you know what I'm going to do? I, I'm, just to make sure that you don't get back into that tree of life, because life is going to be hard now. You're going to start to age. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. You will start to die immediately. And so he puts an angel, but not any angel. An angel with a flaming sword marching back and forth across the entrance. 
Because he said, if I let them back in and if they eat of that tree, they won't die. They'll live in their sin forever. Now take your Bibles with that in mind and pick up Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it. And she gave some to her husband, you know what I think of him, who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Their immediate response was, we've got to cover our sin. We've got to cover our tracks here. Eve, let's gather up some leaves. God won't even notice. What could go wrong? Then the man and his wife heard the Lord God as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said, Where are you? As if he didn't know, by the way. He answered, I, I, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Who told you you're naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Verse 21. Then the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. What just happened here was amazing. They tried to cover their own sin, but it didn't work. They came up with a very reasonable alternative. They're living in a garden. Where better place to find leaves? What better raw material could you think of? Tree bark's a little rough. And so they cover themselves with these leaves and they think they may have got away with it. But God spots the problem immediately. But here's what God does. God now goes out and slaughters one or more animals for the covering of their sin. And he brings back to them skins. This is where you get the artist's impression of cavemen wearing skins. By the way, they were not cavemen and cavewomen. They dwelled in the garden, not the caves. And they covered, he, he covered them with this. But those skins had a price, just like yours does. The price was those animals had to die. And so through the death of an animal, God accepted that as a covering for their sin. Take your Bibles and turn to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus 17, 11. And here's what it says. For the life of the creature is in the blood. Now, let's just stop there for one moment. Your life is not in your brain. Neither is it in your heart. Neither is it in your gut. Your life is in your blood. Do you want proof? Drain your blood. You'll soon see. And as a matter of fact, there's an entire line of medicine called hematology. And what the hematologist does is he just studies blood. That's all. He's a blood doctor. 
Because he knows that if your blood is off in a particular area, both my wife and I just had vast amounts of medical tests, all blood work. You know, you go down there to the lab and they roll up your sleeve and they tie that little thing on and they start with the first needle and they stick it in there and then they start plugging stuff on the back of that. And you're filling one vial, two vials, three vials, four vials and you're thinking, do I have much more? They're draining my life away here. And they take those tests away and they examine the blood in so many different areas and in so many different ways to see if you're okay. Because instinctively they know the life is in the blood and if the blood is wrong, then you're in trouble. And there are a host of conditions which can affect your life permanently because your blood isn't right. Well, for the life of the creature is in the blood. For I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, the creature's life is located in that blood. And I have given it to you as a payment to make atonement. I have, I have given you a way of covering your sin. You started with leaves. I have given you a permanent way for generations through which you can cover your sin. And here it is. The soul that sins shall die, but... I've given you the ability to come in and make sacrifice. And so the Old Testament saints would come in and they would confess their sins. They would bring a goat or a lamb and they would lay their hands upon it and they would confess their sins. This is what we did. This is what my family did. This is what I've done. And then they would take a knife and they would slit the throat of that animal and they would bleed it out, humanely incidentally. And that covered their sin. And God said, I have given you that ability. I've made this possible. Therefore say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor may any alien living, in your, living among you eat blood. Any Israelite or alien among, living among you who hunts any animal or bird that may be eaten must drain out the blood and cover it with earth. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, if, you, if you're hunting, if you, if you hunt for an animal and you, you catch that animal and you intend to eat it, by the way, you must drain the blood. It must be hung upside down and the blood drained and that blood respectfully and adequately buried. Do you know our First Nations people do that? No, they didn't get it out of the Bible. They just do that because they believe the life is in the blood. You must treat the blood with respect is what God is saying because it's the life of that creature. Because the life of every creature is in its blood, verse 14. That's why I said to the Israelites, you must not eat the blood of, every, of any creature because the life of the creature is in the blood. Anyone that eats it must be cut off. What's his point here? His point is, if you kill an animal to eat it, you are not guilty of murder. As long as you take that blood and you respectfully bury it, you treat it with tremendous respect. The life of that creature is in the blood. Take your Bibles and turn with me now. That was just the preamble. Now we'll get to the sermon. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. Matthew 
While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them and saying, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my, the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, let me just break this down real quick. In the Old Testament, there was a covering for blood. Pardon me, a covering for sin. Blood. The blood sacrifice covered their sin. It didn't wash it away. It covered it. It was a band-aid over a sinful act. It was a band-aid over a sinful life. God said, if you bring this sacrifice as I have shown you and told you to do, then I will let you skate. But now, the blood is not a covering any longer. It is forgiveness. And listen to this. It's not just the blood. The blood. Listen to what Jesus said. Verse 28. This is my blood. Now, by the way, he's serving them wine here. He's not serving them his blood, but he's showing that this is a type. And he's saying, this is my, the blood of my, pardon me, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. My blood. Now we're starting to see this whole story of blood starts to come down and funnel into one man, one blood, one point. And guess what? He's going to make that point, and it's going to be recorded by almost, in fact, not almost, it's going to be recorded by all of the gospel writers. Luke will write this in Luke 22, 20. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. In Mark 14, 24, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many. And then in John chapter 6, Verse 54, <coughs> excuse me, we read this. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. What just happened? We were returned to the garden. We were returned to having eternal life. In the garden, they had eternal life in their mortal flesh. But since our flesh has fallen now, God has sent His Son, who died on that cross, and shed His blood. For Did you ever wonder why He shed His blood? Why didn't they just poison Him? You, you, you didn't think they had the technology in those days to poison someone to death? All the kings and queens and people that ran estates, they certainly knew it could be done, and they hired men to eat their food in front of them first. No. His blood had to be shed because his life is in the blood. And when you drink the cup, you are reminding yourself that you have been saved and granted eternal life. The life is in the blood. We have two symbols, two symbols in communion. One is the body, one is the blood. I'm dealing specifically with the blood today. I might next week deal with the body, I'm not sure. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my bl blood will have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. He's saying, listen, there is a real point to this. This is not just show and tell for Christians. This is something very unique and very special. And as we take that cup, we remind ourselves our, our, our sins have been paid for. Not covered, washed. 
and forgiveness has been ministered to us because of the blood. Well, turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 21 for a moment. Romans 3, 21. Do you remember when Jesus stood up and announced to the crowd, unless your righteousness is greater than that of the Pharisees, you're not getting in? Well, here we go. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known. Listen, righteousness under the law came with sacrifice. Now he's saying there's another avenue to righteousness, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. They pointed to it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. <laughs> Here it is. God presented Jesus as your lamb. God presented him. And as a result of that, you are righteous in the eyes of God. Not because you're good, not because you are right, but in spite of you, Amen. by what you believe in and about Jesus, you are washed in the blood Amen. and therefore righteous in God's eyes. When he looks at you, he sees the perfection of his son. Amen. He sees the perfection of Jesus. He doesn't see your weak and distraught form he sees Jesus Amen. and he did this to demonstrate his justice because of the in his forbearance he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished listen all those of the Old Testament that committed sin had their sin covered their sin was left unpunished because God made a way for them to skate on that sin but it only left it undone until Jesus came. And after he shed his blood, it was applied not only forward to you in time, but back to them also whose sins were merely covered. Now they're washed, just as yours are washed. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, and so be the one who justifies those that have faith in Jesus. Turn to Romans chapter 5 for a moment. We're having fun now. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We are not only made righteous, the column is balanced. It is justified. Some of you are old enough to remember checkbooks. A couple of people are smiling because you remember what it was like to write a check. You remember what it was like to stand in line behind somebody that was slow at writing a check. And about halfway through, they'd go, oh, and they'd tear it up and put void on it and bring another check. And then at the end of the month, you had to sit down with your statement and you had to justify it. Bank balance, bank statement, bank charges. You had to justify. Your sins have to be justified. And the justification comes through the blood. I tell you, this is the most powerful stuff in the universe. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We are preaching right now on Tuesday nights through the pre-trib rapture. And here it is. You have been saved from God's wrath. That seven-year tribulation is God's wrath. Yes, I'm aware it's not the only application for it, but it certainly is. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, 
He chose us before, uh, in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Forgiveness of sins in accordance with God's grace. Redemption through his blood. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. We are redeemed through that blood. Amen. The life is in the blood. And when we place ourselves under the blood of Christ and we, 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 we take this element, we're reminding ourselves, I have been redeemed. I have been justified. I have been balanced. I, I, my sins have been paid for. I, I am under forgiveness and grace and mercy. God has done for me what I couldn't do for myself. I would have used leaves. In Colossians 1.19, it says this, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood. You now have peace with God. You are no longer at war with him or at enmity with him. You have peace. How do you have peace? Through the blood. The life is in the blood. You have peace with God through the blood of Jesus. Take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 8. Isaiah 61, verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice, hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make them an everlasting covenant, or make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. Somebody grunt amen. amen. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. He has clothed us with righteousness. How? Through the blood. Through the blood. He took off your leaves and he gave you the blood of Jesus. And when we take this as our communion, what are we saying? We're saying, I recognize that you have saved me that you have made me righteous, that you have forgiven me, that you are my friend and I am your friend, that I have a relationship with you. I am saying that I recognize that eternal life can only come through the blood of Jesus. It does not come through a box of pills or vitamins and I take them all, trust me. Still got sick. comes only through the blood of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19, and we'll close here, maybe. Hebrews 9, 19. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law, <coughs> the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, branches of hyssop, and sprinkle the scroll and all the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. 
In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in the ceremonies. Now it's going back to the story of, uh, of the, the writing of the book of Leviticus. And here he says, listen, I want you to take this blood, or he took the blood, and he began to sprinkle it. And he said, here's the blood of the covenant. This was the Old Testament covenant. But watch what verse 22 says. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Let me read it to you from the King James. And in almost all things, by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Why didn't they kill Jesus some other way? Because his blood had to be shed. And incidentally, when we get closer to next Passover, I'll, I'll deal with this a lot more. But what you need to see here is not only did they shed his blood, they never broke a bone in the shedding of his blood. There are remarkable things in his death. But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There is no forgiveness. And through the shedding of his blood, his life, his eternal life, is ministered into you. And so every time we take this, we are saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for what I could not get for myself. I have gotten from you, and I am grateful. Amen. That's why we take the communion. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, as we head down now towards the table and the communion, I pray, Lord, that if there be some here that don't know you, that they would take this moment to repent of their sins and come to you. Lord, if there be some watching on the video that cannot honestly say they know this Jesus, Father, I pray that this would be their moment to make a decision for you. Lord, I thank you that you are ready, willing, and waiting to forgive them their sins. Father, in Jesus' name, come into their lives. Forgive them of their sins. And as we take this this morning, Lord, help us to remember the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.